Who do you see? A father? A husband? Brother? Son? Board director? Chairperson? Footy fanatic? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A husband? A father? Writer? Volunteer? Project manager? Basketballer? Coffee lover? With a mental illness? Which one will you define you by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A husband? A father? Writer? Volunteer? Project manager? Basketballer? Coffee lover? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Good afternoon and welcome to the 2022 uh, Mental Health Coalition of South Australia Mental Health Forum. I'm David Washington. I'm the editorial director of Solstice Media. We are a South Australian publisher of In Daily, uh, independent news website, um, City Mag and SA Life. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today. We are broadcasting to you from Ghana land and I would like to acknowledge elders past, present, and future, we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture, and that importantly, their knowledge of mental health and wellbeing has been held in this place for thousands of years. I'd also like to acknowledge those with uh, mental health challenges, past and present, and the value, impact and diversity of your lived experience. I know that the Mental Health Coalition draws from this understanding and wisdom as the foundation of their work every day. 
Our panelists today, I would like to welcome the Minister for Health and Wellbeing, Stephen Wade, Chris Picton, the Opposition Spokesperson for Health and Wellbeing, Tammy Franks, representing the Greens. Unfortunately, uh, Connie Benaris from SA Best um, has had a bereavement and she can't be with us today. Uh, her presentation will be on the uh, Mental Health Coalition Facebook page and also linked from their website during this forum today. Um, and our thoughts are with Connie. So our aim today, we want to find out from our panellists their vision for South Australia's mental health um, system and respond also to the findings of the Mental Health Coalition's report done for them by PwC. It's about a case for investing in community mental health services. You can find that document, and it's a very interesting one, on the Coalition's website as well. So just briefly to set the scene, I think in the third year of the pandemic and as we head to the state election in March, there's arguably no more important um, public policy issue than mental health. So today we hope to learn a lot more about not only what our politicians and political leaders are planning to do to improve support for people in crisis, but also how to help serve people's individual needs in the community the system-wide stuff and also the individual stuff. We're going to start today's forum with a three-minute overview, overview of our panellists' visions and policies. Um, then we're going to go into a Q&A session. Um, we've got fairly strict time limits on those, only two minutes for answers. Um, we're also going to um, make use of questions that some of you have sent in to us this week. And you can continue to send in questions by going to the comments section on where you're watching this, Facebook or YouTube, and adding it there. And they'll be fed through to me, to my phone, and we'll see what see how many we can get through in the time we've allotted. Um, if somebody puts in a question you want answered, that they're already got there before you, just hit like on it and we'll move it up the list. Um, and at the end of the forum, we're going to ask everyone for a short one minute summary. Um, and then we'll have a brief break. And at 2.20, uh, journalist Louise Pascali, uh, Ross Momsley from SACOS and lived experience worker Chris Chalubek will do a bit of a rundown and analysis of what, what we've heard today. Before our broadcast, we chose some names out of the hat, totally randomly, about the order in which people would speak. And first off the uh, bat is the Minister, Stephen Wade. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, David. I joined David in acknowledging the Wurundjeri land and also acknowledging people with lived experience. I'd like to thank the Mental Health Coalition for arranging the, the forum and for all of you for participating. The Marshall Liberal Government was elected with a commitment to rebalance the health system towards mental health. This is a long-term reform challenge. We've made strong progress, but there is much more to do. When we came to office, there was no plan for mental health services. There hadn't been for seven years. Following a comprehensive year-long consultation process, Mental Health Services Plan 2020-2025 was released in 2019. We've made strong progress in implement, implementing the plan. The election campaign proper starts in a week's time. During the campaign, the Liberal Party will be making specific commitments to continue our work in relation to mental health services. One of the challenges that we've been dealing with in our first term has been access to the NDIS for people with psychosocial disability. I believe that there are hundreds of South Australians who have not been approved and the scheme needs to be more responsive to people's changing circumstances, including when they're looking to be discharged from hospital. In terms of service delivery by the Marshall Liberal Government in its first term, we are proud of the investment and innovation that we've, we are delivering. In the shadow of Oakton, uh, we've opened the Neurobehavioural Unit and the Specialised Advanced Dementia Unit at the REPAT. We've established the state's first borderline personality disorder service, BPD Co. We've commissioned Australia's first adult mental health centre, the Urgent Mental Health Care Centre in Grenfell Street. The Mental Health Co Responder Ambulance Service has also been put in place. In June last year, we committed a, a landmark $163.5 million 
uh, investment in, in projects in addition to our $530 million annual recurrent spend. Two key projects in this package were a new $48 million 20-bed older person's acute mental health unit at Modbury and a new 16-bed crisis stabilisation centre in the northern suburbs. A re-elected Marshall Liberal government will strengthen the law to respect the self-autonomy and human rights of people engaging with mental health services. We are well advanced in a project to reform restrictive practices law, and this year we will initiate a rights-focused review of the Mental Health Act. There is much more to be done. The Marshall Liberal Government is working with people with lived experience and the broader health, mental health community in crafting better services. Co-design is key to building a better future. Thanks very much, Minister. Um, there's a, some interesting things there that I think we can tease out later. Next out of the hat is a Tammy Franks from the Greens. Good afternoon, Minamani. I acknowledge I'm here on Ghana land. Uh, I also acknowledge indeed the uh, elders of us from the region and also that uh, First Nations people continue to organise and mobilise in our community. Uh, I acknowledge too the lived experience and the importance of the voices of consumers and carers uh, in these debates and that they are not simply clinical issues. The Greens have a really bold vision, not just for this election, the state election on March the 19th, but for the federal election when it comes before May this year. Unlike you know, the two gentlemen outside of me, I'm not here asking to be the Minister of Health and Wellbeing. Uh, I'm here to put forward the Greens' vision of what we would do with balance of power, whether that is in the Upper House of the South Australian Parliament, or at the federal level where we believe we can, just with a few hundred votes within a few seats, actually hold balance of power again uh, with a shared arrangement with the Labor government. What would we do if we were to get into those positions of some power, although not government? Well, we'd actually have a bold vision for something very different. And for mental health, that means the social determinants of health, the social determinants of mental health. That would be some of our first priorities. We have a bold vision for ensuring that in the state we'll go back to having a housing bus to ensure that social housing, 40,000 new social houses for all those in need. We have a bold plan for free public transport for those to access the majority of our uh, society's uh, education and employment and uh, activities. We have a plan to fund this through going back to the weather plan for a big bank levy and having the guts to put that up again in the parliament. It only lost by a vote last time with an increase in the Greens we could get that through. Also to make the resources sector pay their fair share and to ensure that developers who make a windfall, what's called a windfall tax, pay their fair share where there is a rezone in the land. Now these aren't mental health issues but these are how we would fund better mental health care and how we would do that at the federal and state level is we would get rid of the cost shifting. We would have a single funding agency so that the blame game could stop between states and um, the, the feds. We would also put mental health into Medicare, both dental health and mental health into Medicare where it belongs. Mental health is not an auxiliary to health, it is part of the core health um, provision. Uh, we would also invest in things uh, such as uh, preventative health and certainly the McCann cuts back under the uh, then Minister Snellen were ones that we would, with that money, invest and rewind and ensure we're keeping people out of hospitals, keeping them well, having a society where they can live not in poverty, where they are well housed and able to access the full benefits. We are talking about things like the job guarantee, but also ensuring that, as I say, consumers, those with lived experience, guide uh, the way that our programs and uh, uh, health system um, is implemented. Thanks very much, and excellent timekeeping so far by everyone involved. <laughs>
Um, and finally, uh, Chris Picton from Labor. Uh, thank you very much, David. Acknowledge uh, David and the work that In Daily does to highlight this important issue. Acknowledge we meet on the traditional lands of the Ghana people. Acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. And also note the importance of providing better Aboriginal uh, mental health services across the state. Um, and thank uh, Jeff and the team at the Mental Health Coalition for their advocacy and having us here today. I think when we're talking about mental health, it's easy to get lost in systems and statistics and uh, talking about facilities. Um, I've had the privilege in the past four years as the Shadow Minister to meet many of the people who've been impacted, uh, many of the people who uh, have stories in terms of uh, how they have suffered because of the failures of our mental health system. And I think it's important to focus in terms of uh, what we can do to help those people. I think about uh, the mother of a 14-year-old uh, son with autism, who uh, the son became violent, uh, had a significant episode, uh, was brought to the Women's and Children's Hospital, uh, but didn't see a psychiatrist, uh, was discharged without any care plan, uh, and that happened uh, multiple times. I think about uh, the mother who uh, had a daughter with PTSD who was uh, brought, to, uh, who needed an ambulance for an uh, urgent violent episode, uh, but no ambulance came for four hours in the current system. Uh, and I think about uh, the also the staff who work in our health system uh, who are trying their best with very limited resources. Think about the uh, amazing staff I met last week at the Norlunga Mental Health Services, the Southern Intermediate Care Services. Uh, on their last day, as they were packing up their desks, who were distraught, who were crying because of the fact that the government has closed down that service and told them that that 15 beds, uh, those services that provide care for people, is going to be closed down for the next 12 months, they've been told, uh, and that they know that the people that they care for and provide services for are going to be missing out and going to be putting more pressure elsewhere across the system. We know that the, there are uh, solutions. We know that we do need to do a lot more. Earlier this year, we had a round table uh, with a lot of the key stakeholders, including uh, the Mental Health Coalition, including uh, people with lived experience, to look at uh, how we can address this situation. It's very clear uh, that it's not an either or situation. We need to do more uh, in our acute system, but we also need to do more in our community system, and not enough has been done. Uh, the minister, Mr Wade, said that uh, they haven't announced their election policies yet. Well, they have actually announced one election policy, uh, and that's to build a $662 million basketball stadium. We've announced if we're elected, we will cancel that project in its entirety and put all of that money into our health system, including in mental health, including in acute mental health, but in community mental health as well to address this issue. We've also announced a $50 million investment uh, into mental health workers in schools because prevention is key. We need to have early intervention as much as possible, and that sadly isn't happening at the moment. Uh, and the last thing that we need in our system uh, is more cuts to happen. Uh, just last week, the week before, uh, we saw released a report that was done by consultants, Cordamentha, in our health system, uh, which Cordamentha have been paid over $40 million. Uh, they've come up with a plan to cut over $100 million uh, potentially from our health system, including from mental health services, including eight mental health beds in this report that was released last week. The minister says he hasn't seen this report, he hasn't read it. I'm very happy to give him a copy of that today. We can't afford any more of these cuts. We've also seen cuts to community mental health services that have just made the situation so much worse. We need to be investing to help people, early intervention, but also in our acute system, to make sure we don't hear more of these tragic circumstances happening again. Thanks very much. Um, and there are some issues that you've all raised there that I'll circle back to. But now we're coming to questions. And I'm going to start with questions that have been sent in by, um, by people in the community. And I thought I'd pick up on that, um, the idea that I think all of you have touched on that it's the, the system is um, complicated, that sometimes the focus is on um, acute, it's on, it's on hospitals, it's on waiting times, things like that. But I would recommend everyone have a look on the Mental Health Coalition website for the PwC report, which is technically called The Case for Investing in Psychosocial Supports to Improve the Lives of South Australians. It's very interesting, um, has a lot of interesting data in there about how people are supported in the community, what happens 
in the hospital system as well. And what it does highlight, though, is a, a lot of unmet need out there for people who are seeking um, support in the community. Um, and one of the goals that it puts is to reduce this unmet need by 50% within three years. Um, I'd like to ask all of you um, whether you'd commit to this, and I think we'll stick with the order <laughs> that we started with, so uh, Minister Stephen Wade to begin with. Well, certainly the, um, the government is, uh, is committed to making sure that we deliver on our mental health services plan. The mental health services plan talks about commissioning services that meet the needs of people in, in South Australia with mental health challenges. Part of that uh, implementation of that plan has been the NGO redesign project, which is uh, looking at, 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 at how we can refocus uh, our um, not NGO funding in South Australia to meet the unmet need. Uh, in that context, there's a, a particular focus in the work of the uh, NGO design, redesign team at enhancing uh, psychosocial um, supports. Uh, in that context, there's also an unmet needs report that's, uh, that is currently being prepared so that we can get a better line of sight as to, as to where there is need. I think it's also important not, uh, not only to uh, make sure that we're providing state government resources for uh, people with um, psychosocial disability, uh, but also uh, in the in the um, the Commonwealth arena, um, I've seen estimates that probably about a, um, a, a thousand uh, people with psychosocial disability uh, who should be eligible for NDIS uh, services are not receiving them. Uh, effectively, that is um, is in tens of millions of dollars that could be being made available just by people accessing uh, accessing their entitlements. Another issue that the NGO redesign team highlighted was the opportunity to use state money to support case coordination, case management. That's often a, a problem with people who are receiving support under the uh, NDIS. Uh, the, NDI, the NGO redesign project highlighted that as an opportunity to help people with psychosocial disability have their needs met. So not quite a commitment to the actual <laughs> Well, figure, but I can see that you're, yeah. well, you're thinking in that look, direction. Let's put this way. We've got an unmet needs report. We accept yeah. that there are unmet needs. We need to get a handle on them. We need yeah. to um, make sure that we target our current resources uh, as, as uh, effectively as we can. Tammy Franks? Um, it's easy for the Greens to say we'll commit because, of course, we're sure. not going to be in the Treasury or uh, in the Ministry. However, uh, I would say that the Greens have a very strong commitment to addressing these issues and to ensuring that the unmet needs are indeed met. Uh, it was the Greens, in fact, that have uh, exposed the, some of the failures of the NDIS, which, while well-meaning, have actually seen quite a few people fall through the cracks, particularly uh, in terms of... Uh, those uh, disabilities that are not physical and this is where we find ourselves and we also know that even with the current NDIS uh, those uh, services previously provided are being cut year by year. It was uh, Senator Jordan Steele-John who actually pushed as well for the Royal uh, Commission that has seen these issues put to the fore. It's been the Greens who pushed not just to recognise borderline personality disorder week but indeed to see uh, that uh, BPD Co eventually set up when in the parliament people were not willing to acknowledge the existence of the groups advocating uh, or in fact their awareness weeks. That's where we come in. Uh, I think that uh, as I say we will work to end the cost shifting. We will work to expose where the NDIS has had those failed failures of continual service. And the other area that we've always been very strong on is ensuring that the NGO sector, the non-government sector, is actually resourced properly. So people have portable long service leave if they're in that sector. People have good pay and conditions. People have certainty and their organisations have contracts that just aren't year to year or um, short term to short term and their contracts are either renewed or put out again to tender well before they expire. So those are the things that we will continue to push and we will also ensure we don't continue to privatise essential services. Chris Picton, can we get a commitment from you? Uh, well, thank you very much, David. I mean, we, uh, as I said earlier, I do believe that there needs to be a significant investment in community mental health care and care for people uh, in their homes to keep them well and out of hospital. Uh, we'll be announcing more of that uh, in specific details before the election. Uh, but I want to tell you why it is important, uh, because I've met a lot of people who provide these services and a lot of people who receive them. 
uh, and for a lot lower cost than providing that care uh, in hospital and a lot less trauma and pain to the people involved in going through that system, for lack of a better word, uh, we can help people stay healthy, uh, stay in their own homes. The Minister talked about there's many people not getting access to the NDIS. Uh, well, absolutely, we completely 100% agree with that. It's a huge problem. Uh, so why did the government embark upon a cuts program to those support services on the basis that people were apparently getting access to the NDIS, which they haven't been? Uh, this is absolutely critical. We know that there's a huge uh, demand on our services. We know that at the moment, people are being told in a crisis, you've got to call mental health triage, but there's reports that up to 60% of those phone calls to mental health triage are not getting answered. We know that our community mental health teams in our local hospital networks are massively under strain. Uh, unable to see uh, regularly the people that they need to see. And that only puts more pressure on our hospitals, more pressure on our ramping situation. Uh, so this absolutely does need to be addressed. Had some uh, really good questions come through. And, and this one, I think, is pertinent to what we've been discussing about resources. How can we shift the needle to invest more in prevention? And what are the barriers? Particularly, um, this questionnaire is interested in how we reduce the risk of our youth experiencing mental health dis distress and preventing them from needing crisis support. And uh, I think this is a really pertinent question in the context of uh, what younger people have been going through in the pandemic. Um, Stephen Waite. Certainly the Marshall Liberal Government has a, a strong priority for uh, youth mental health. Uh, that's why we um, we invested in the redevelopment of the, the Mallee Ward at the Women's and Children's Hospital as part of the uh, the, sustain, the sustainment work there. Uh, in terms of um, services for um, which have a particular relevance for uh, for younger people, um, we've, uh, we're investing strongly in the, in a statewide eating disorder facility at the at the Repat site. In terms of um, in terms of early intervention and wellbeing, um, beyond the um, the, the Department of Health and Wellbeing itself, the um, the Office of the, um, sorry, I should say, the um, Wellbeing SA has a specific secretariat focused uh, on building wellbeing and resilience, and not only young people, but whole, uh, the families and communities. Uh, we need to make sure that people uh, people develop the skills so that they can respond to, to whatever whatever challenges uh, life may, may bring to them. Uh, there's certainly work being done in the schools also to make sure that there are wellbeing officers in the schools to support young people, to identify issues early, to make sure that they get the support they need. In terms of the $163 million uh, investment in the, in the last budget, uh, $8, uh, $8 million of that was uh, specifically focused on community mental health services, another seven in the context of COVID. We appreciate that COVID is, is a particular challenge uh, to, to our community. Uh, both those with uh, with mental health uh, challenges, but also to, to people as they cope with what what are very distressing circumstances uh, for many people. Uh, so th there's, this is an area where we share responsibility with the Commonwealth Government, of course, through the primary health care um, networks such as Medicare funded programs uh, and the PHNs. It's really important that we, as a state government, while we have particular responsibility for the acute services, um, support where we can the early intervention uh, primary health care services. Tammy, Frank. Thank you. Um, look, we're going through a pandemic, and if the pandemic is an earthquake, the tsunami to come is mental health and mental ill health, and nowhere will that be more keenly felt, I think, than with young people. Um, the Greens do have a real vision for ensuring, as I say, putting uh, mental health into Medicare, but also shifting that... Um, blame game and having a single costing and funding source. But some of our policies include replacing school chaplains that are currently based on a religious provision of services with psychologists or trained professionals to help with their mental wellbeing. Uh, that is to us quite fundamental and uh, quite an obvious change that needs to be made very urgently. Uh, we also would be providing cognitive behavioural therapy to those uh, under 25 because we know getting in at that early intervention point is actually going to have very long-term benefits for them to live well. We provide um, by lifting the, the standards around, you know, a living income, good housing, access to 
um, transport and opportunity, we know that that's also going to have an impact on those children's lives as they go through as we support those families. Uh, I guess also stop having arguments about people's gender identity in parliaments and their sexuality in parliaments and saying it's okay for schools to discriminate against them. That would be going a long way to actually increasing and in supporting the mental health of so many young people in this country. Yeah, thank you, David. I mean, this is absolutely a massive issue, particularly uh, at the moment in terms of the uh, pandemic, but also uh, agree with Tammy in terms of, I'm sure, the last week has been very traumatising for many young people across South Australia, seeing what uh, the Morrison government is doing in Canberra. Um, we absolutely need to do more. We need to help uh, these kids who are uh, in strife, and we need to do it as early as possible to make sure that they've got the best possibility um, of recovery. That's why we've already announced uh, that we will invest uh, for up to 100 extra mental health and other learning support officers and staff in school. $50 million investment, uh, which is absolutely essential because for many kids, uh, if you don't have a significant bank balance for your parents, uh, the idea of getting access to a private psychologist or a private psychiatrist uh, is complete fantasy for most families. Uh, we need to provide that help through our school system uh, as early as possible. The waiting lists at the moment are completely uh, ridiculous. Uh, and so this will go a long way to making sure that we can provide that support because we know that that burden is increasing. And we know, as uh, Tammy said, I agree with, uh, that the longest curve uh, of this pandemic will be the mental health impacts, particularly on young people. Thanks. Um, I want to um, go back to something that you said, Minister, in your, um, in your presentation about the human rights focused review of the Mental Health Act that you're committing to, uh, if you're re-elected. Um, and we've had, we know, um, uh, and this is um, a reflection on, uh, a terrible reflection on the system really, that people with mental health and in particularly in, uh, in crisis have had their human rights, um, uh, um, uh, they've, had, they've had their rights, um, um, struggling for the word <laughs> all of a sudden. Uh, they, they've, they've been restrained, there's been constraint. Um, they've also been waiting for a long time uh, in EDs. Um, we've had a question that comes through about, um, she had police come for, a, for a, wel a welfare check and it ended up being a physical altercation. Um, that's not the first time I've, I've heard of that. Um, what do you, I'll ask the Minister, what do you want to achieve with this um, rights um, focused review of the Act? And um, Tammy and Chris, what do you, do you, do you also believe that it's, it's warranted and what, what direction that should take? Thanks, thanks David. Um, Marshall Liberal Government has already demonstrated that mental, the uh, rights of people with mental health issues need to be front and centre of delivering, of, uh, delivering care. Uh, we, we talk in the health system about patient-centred care. For people with uh, mental health issues, often it's not just about being patient-centred. They actually find that their, their rights are ignored as health care is being delivered, uh, almost ignoring their, their wishes. So we want a fundamental refocus on, on patients, on people with mental health issues in, in, in whichever domain uh, they're receiving services. We've already demonstrated that commitment in, the, in the, this term of government. Uh, there's been work already done to establish a consistent restrictive practices framework which will be applied across all of the um, relevant domains such as correctional services, disability uh, and, and in mental health. Uh, within the Office of Chief Psychiatrist we've, we've had a human rights and coercion reduction uh, committee which has been working uh, with the goal to uh, have a human rights lens over all facets of mental health policy uh, and uh, health policy design and, and delivery. Uh, in the context of the uh, advanced, correct, uh, advanced Care Directives um, legislation review this year, um, I gave a, a commitment that the, the current uh, provision in relation to uh, negating an advanced care directive uh, if somebody is, is uh, seeking to stop receiving care in the context of suicide, that that would be referred to the Mental Health Act review. Mental Health Act review um, will have terms of reference which specifically focus on putting a human rights lens uh, into our mental health legislation. 
Uh, these uh, the mental health legislation, of course, dates back to the colonial era. But I think what we've seen the Marshall Liberal government deliver in, in the last four years and lay the foundation for in, in the next term of parliament is a strong re, uh, reorientation to move out of the archaic uh, psychiatric institution approach towards a much more human rights, a, a patient-centred approach. Tammy. It'll come as no surprise to those who pay attention to the Greens policies that, of course, we're always going to prioritise human rights and uh, we're not going to sacrifice those uh, principles simply for the, the sake of convenience or ease. Uh, these are difficult questions, though, when it is put in a mental health framework. And they've been difficult questions under this pandemic uh, with our public health response, which is quite rightly restricted in some ways people's human rights. Um, what of the things that the Greens can contribute here is uh, pointing to our record of ensuring that human rights frameworks have been put in, that our various United Nations uh, conventions uh, have uh, been strengthened through Greens' work in the Parliament, and we commit we will always do that. Some of the good suggestions that we've had, and I know that the Minister is well aware of this because I've asked him quite a few times in Parliament, uh, has been championed in uh, Western Australia by former uh, Greens MLC, Alison Zamon. Uh, where the response, uh, Mr Washington, that you raised just then of the police doing the welfare checks, uh, the response to those in mental health crisis is not one that should be done by somebody in a uniform who's trained uh, to enforce the law. It should be done by somebody with expertise in mental health and in those sorts of situations. So certainly there in WA, there's been uh, some wonderful programs rolled out um, with getting those mental health uh, uh, professionals out to those situations, particularly where they're in crisis, but certainly that would be for welfare checks as well. Chris. Um, thank you, David. Look, absolutely uh, support the need that we do need to look at the mental health acts uh, from a human rights approach. It is uh, been, uh, as was said, a very significantly old uh, drafted document um, that uh, in many ways we've seen other states uh, really uh, leap above us in terms of their framework that they have in place. It can't just be the framework, it actually has to be what happens in practice as well. And what we've seen in practice happen over the past four years is we've seen an absolute uh, shocking deterioration in terms of the number of people who have been stuck uh, in emergency departments uh, for days and days on end, which has been rightly described as a breach of their uh, human rights. I've seen in the emergency departments uh, where people are kept for days and days upon end. This is not a therapeutic environment. This is not going to help their recovery. This is only going to make the situation and their recovery worse. Um, and to have that situation getting worse, it's almost been a fourfold increase in the number of people who have been stuck for more than 24 hours in our emergency departments. And then you see uh, some of the uh, most human rights uh, based approaches that we have in our system in the uh, intermediate care uh, centres that we have that have just been shut down, We're providing excellent uh, patient uh, consumer focus services to make sure that we uh, care for people in an appropriate way, uh, but those centres are now sitting empty now, uh, is the completely wrong approach. We need the capacity in the system to make sure that it's not just a policy on a written page saying we'll look after people's human rights, but this actually happens in practice for people. I think I'd like to um, um, explore that detail about the intermediate care centres. So um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, Minister, but these are meant to be their step-down facilities from acute care. So two centres have been closed, um, one in the west and, and one in the south recently, and I think the reason was to free up resources for the COVID response. Um, surely uh, the COVID response requires as many mental health beds in whatever form that we can get them. What is the future of that? Does that model have a future, I guess, is the question. Yeah, the advice I've received is that um, both of the, uh, the ICC in the, in the West at Queenstown and the ICC in the South were closed temporarily in the context of COVID. Uh, first of all, the health, the health system is facing a challenge in terms of furloughed staff. Even now, as we're coming off the Omicron wave, we've still got 300 uh, SA health staff who, who are furloughed. Also, there are additional uh, demands on the, on, on, the, on the health teams in terms of vaccination um, and, um, and testing. 
Uh, so I'm advised that um, they, they were closed in the context of the COVID challenge and that um, provision was made for the, their clients to receive the care they needed uh, in, in a community context. In relation to the Queenstown site, I'm, I, I'm advised that that will reopen on Monday, uh, 14th of February. Uh, in relation to, this, to the southern site, um, I haven't been given a, 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 a time for reopening, but uh, I understand that there is some discussion about my model changes there and that the chief psychiatrist is actually uh, meeting with, with Salen uh, in the near future to discuss what those uh, changes might involve. It is important that we keep uh, looking at, um, at how we can continue to develop our models of care. Another uh, form of uh, community-based care is community re rehabilitation beds, and uh, they, for example, are often um, well below their capacity. So I think that with whatever resources we have in, in whichever part of the, uh, the network of care, that we uh, constantly look at, um, at making sure that they are relevant for, 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 the, for the clients, uh, that they're accessible for the clients. Um, but I certainly believe that uh, the, the step-down uh, facilities such as the ICC are, ve are a very important uh, part of the, the network of care. It might be for stepping down as you come out of um, hospital. Uh, it might be for stepping up uh, as your mental health challenges are escalating. But we need to make sure that we've got a range of uh, services and resources uh, that, can, uh, that can be provided to clients as they deal with their challenges. It's incredibly important to have stepping up and stepping down services and uh, keeping people uh, not just living well and giving them the bit of support that they need if they need a little bit or in fact able to exit the acute um, support and we know that there's a lot of people who aren't able to exit the acute support who then create some of the the backlogs and so on that we see. But what I'm interested in, in then in the Minister's answer was that the closure of these centres was put down to staff being furloughed. I chair the COVID-19 response committee. It was the AMA who disclosed to us some of the closures of these sorts of services and also including some of the detox alcohol and drug uh, services. That was news to us and it was a surprise. When I asked as well in the modelling whether or not and I understand at one point there was a thousand furloughed staff, although I could be corrected, it was a thousand. But that wasn't even taken into consideration in the modelling for our planning. So we have failed to plan here uh, to keep people living well through this pandemic when we have actually had two years to have done that planning. I find that uh, a little bit of a hard pill to swallow. Chris. Yeah, look, I uh, absolutely agree. This is another failure to plan before the borders opened in making sure that there was sufficient staff. We know uh, this is one of the uh, issues that um, John Mendoza, who resigned uh, because uh, he was so fed up with SA Health, uh, raised uh, in terms of his concerns about the system, uh, that uh, short-term contracts were constantly being offered, not attractive enough for people, and hence there were so many vacancies of the system. But I've had the benefit of actually uh, meeting the people who work in the Norlunga Centre that's just been closed. Uh, and they didn't say that there was desperate uh, vacancies because people have been furloughed that they needed to fill. They said that SA Health had been struggling to find them other positions to move to. Uh, so this was clearly a decision that was made uh, to close this centre uh, that has now uh, led to less capacity in our system. Uh, they've been told that it's going to stay closed for a year. Uh, and uh, this is one of the differences between actually meeting the people on the ground who are hearing what's actually going on versus just getting a briefing on the situation, uh, is that very clearly uh, this is a centre that should be there providing services, uh, has provided excellent services over the past 10 years, is a pretty modern facility, only 10 years old in, the, in this health system where there's a lot older facilities than that. Uh, and providing very patient-centred care. This is exactly the sort of centre that we need to see more of, not less. Mm. And um, we've had um, more questions come through along the lines of, and this is borne out in the PwC report as well, that we, we don't, we're not having improving performance in the mental health system. If performance is the right word, it means the outcomes are, are getting worse. Um, and yet we spend more here on, um, on acute care than, we, than other states do. How can we um, refocus the system on 
on innovation and even experimentation and find some, some new ways that work. Well, uh, David, that's exactly what the Marshall Liberal Government is doing. And I think the, the, the best two examples are both in relation to providing people alternative pathways before they um, need to go to an emergency department for a mental health issue. Uh, we've established Australia's first adult mental health care centre, the Urgent Mental Health Care Centre uh, at Grenfell Street, which provides a lounge-like environment where both uh, mental health workers, uh, clinicians and, and peer workers uh, work with clients uh, to, to deal with their uh, mental health issues without needing to go to what is often a hectic, unhelpful, untherapeutic environment of, of, a, um, uh, of an emergency department. Uh, the other program which is uh, also providing an alternative uh, to, to an ED presentation is uh, MH Core, the Mental Health Co-Responders Program, where mental health clinicians alongside an ambulance officer go to, go to the uh, client in the community, look at uh, opportunities that, that might be able to be uh, made available to them in terms of linking them to community services, or the mental health uh, clinician and the ambulance officer may themselves um, provide uh, treatment and, and support. Uh, that's leading to about 70% of those clients receiving the care they need without needing to go to a hospital. I believe both of those programs are, are innovative. They're both cost effective um, significantly because they, uh, they avoid the need to, to engage expensive hospital-based services. But very importantly, they're, they're client focused. They're, they're directly engaging the client in terms of what services they need, making, uh, making links that, that work for them. I believe that um, innovation is, is, has been a key theme of the Marshall Liberal Government. It's, it, is, it is improving performance. Uh, we are very keen to continue on those uh, exploring new opportunities and often doing that with uh, the, the non-government organisation centre. In spite of uh, criticism from the opposition, we're proud to be partners with NEMI in the delivery of the urgent mental health care service. Uh, we believe that NG NGOs uh, bring real expertise and we need to, to continue to par partner with them so that we can continue to provide better high quality mental health services. Amy? I'll start where the Minister uh, just finished with, which is those urgent uh, mental health services that are a lounge-like environment. We do need more of those, and that is an excellent idea and an innovation. Uh, but I think when we're talking about innovation and bigger ideas, we're actually talking about rethinking this and empowering those, uh, not necessarily in government, to have those big ideas to challenge the structures. And that is ensuring that our mental health commission or commissioners are adequately resourced and not eroded. That is ensuring we have things like the Health Performance Council and other bodies with oversight here putting out those independent thoughts on how we can do things better. And it is actually big thinking like ensuring that we're really tackling trauma. And if we want to talk about mental health, we've got to get real about talking about trauma and getting in at those early stages and addressing those trauma issues from, you know, cradle to grave, really. Chris Picton. Yeah, thank you, David. Look, I agree uh, certainly with Tammy that some of those um, key bodies are really important in terms of driving uh, change, particularly the Health Performance Council that the government uh, was trying to remove, but uh, it provides that independent oversight of the system. Uh, but almost more importantly uh, than all of those systems uh, is actually working with consumers, actually having that co-design that is often talked about, uh, but actually working with them uh, in our various communities across the state uh, on these solutions. So it's something I'm very committed to doing. Um, I'm very uh, absolutely delighted that we've seen over the past few years uh, Leland start up in South Australia providing that advocacy uh, unfortunately, it sort of happened uh, as the Health Consumers Alliance were defunded by the government, um, and so all their funding was taken away uh, in the government's first budget. Uh, but we have seen Leland providing that role, and I think uh, we need to see uh, more engagement of them in across, right across our system, because we do have a problem. Uh, as was said, the, the statistics are getting worse. Uh, there's almost been a fourfold increase in terms of the number of people stuck in emergency departments for over four, uh, for 24 hours, some of whom for four days, which is just a shocking amount. And they're not just statistics, they're real people uh, who are suffering through that. And so we need to work with the people who have been impacted uh, to develop those solutions. Thanks. We're getting a lot of questions coming through about services for children um, and a lot of comments as well about gaps in the mental health system 
about um, concern about young uh, trans people and youth. Uh, also, parents noting a struggle to get support for their children, the women's and children's, um, when they have particularly AD, ADHD or autism. But um, to boil all that down, um, other than prevention, which we've talked about, what specific services can we do better or could we introduce for um, to support uh, children's mental health, which I, th I think has been a, a, as, as under pressure as any other demographic group, any other age group, I should say, over the last few years. Well, in, in terms of, um, of the Women's and Children's Hospital, um, we, as I said, we have invested in the, in the upgrade of the Mallee Ward. Uh, in terms of capacity, um, we, we, it does not seem that there is a um, bed capacity issue. My understanding is that there's, there's often a significant number of uh, beds that are not filled. But certainly families have raised concerns about, the, about whether or not um, Women's and Children's Hospital is being, uh, is being open enough in terms of, um, uh, of their admission criteria, whether, whether, they're, um, whether people who need, who need to have a, a period of uh, inpatient care are receiving it. I know that uh, a group of families uh, met with the chief psychiatrist uh, recently, and he is going to be uh, reviewing a number of cases um, to explore that. We want to make sure that if if a child needs in, inpatient care, um, they they receive it. Uh, one of our uh, other innovations that is also helping uh, children with mental health issues is the Child and Adolescent Virtual Care Service, which was established in in August last year, and has already provided. Uh, care to over a, over a thousand children and adolescents. Uh, that, that service uh, is available uh, for people right around the state and it is available to support people uh, with mental health issues, particularly uh, children and adolescents. Uh, in relation to, um, to autism, there, there, there were is issues raised in relation to whether the Mallee Ward was not available uh, to people with autism. My understanding is that the um, the issue is is whether or not the primary um, diagnosis is is a psychiatric one. If a person uh, has a psychiatric diagnosis and needs to be admitted to the uh, to the Mallee to the Mallee Ward, uh, the fact that they also have autism should not preclude them. Uh, so certainly um, issues have been raised, and and the chief psychiatrist is looking at them. Tell me. Anyone who's been through this system knows that you're facing long waits, lots of uncertainty, a long way to get a diagnosis, and that diagnosis can often be the key to actually then getting you the supports that you need when that process is taking years and literally that is um, the, the vast majority of that young person's life, this is taking too long. Uh, it's easy to say that, but actually through the school system we have some funding uh, for this sort of work and this sort of identification to be being done that teachers tell me isn't being pursued and while, while the policies are there, in fact, the, the money for uh, kids with disabilities and also identifying these processes through the, the current structures isn't actually getting through to the kids most in need and it does affect particularly uh, when you're talking ADHD, autism and the like, if your diagnosis is even more uh, unusual, if, if you to put it that way, more rare. Um, I think you're even looking at a, a bigger challenge. Um, I'm somebody who's had a child go through this system. I'm speaking from first-hand knowledge. I know how hard it is to get the support you need, and yet I'm somebody who's a member of parliament, who's reasonably well connected, and yet you know the number of medical professionals that you get passed from pillar to post to, and just as you find somebody they then move on or they can't take your child because uh, criteria changes or, or the like, or CAMS, you know, reshuffles all the education department, reshuffles their internal bureaucracy uh, is extraordinary. It's not good enough. We actually know that the money's there. In this case, the money's not the problem. It's the processes. Chris. Yeah, thank you, David. I mean, completely uh, agree that the system for children who need acute mental health care is completely in crisis. I've already talked about how we need to invest more to help uh, kids at an early intervention stage in schools. When they are reaching an acute stage, uh, there's huge difficulties getting access to CAMS. There's huge difficulties if you go to the Women's and Children's Emergency Department to get the care that you need. I've already spoken about um, you know, one of the families I met with that 14-year-old with autism, violent episode, SAS told them they had to be uh, brought to the emergency department, uh, but 
but that they were then discharged without seeing a psychiatrist uh, and without any care plan or follow-up. This is happening to many, many families. There is a group, as the Minister said, uh, that has been set up to advocate for change. It's called Parents for Change. Uh, I haven't had just my officers meet with these parents. I've met with them myself to hear their stories. Uh, and it is absolutely heartbreaking. These are parents who, uh, as, as Tammy was saying from her personal experience, are very articulate, uh, have the ability to advocate very strongly, but are still finding it very difficult uh, to advocate on behalf of their children who need help. Uh, they're having a rally uh, in a few weeks' time. I encourage people uh, to go along to that uh, because we do need change to make sure that uh, there is additional support uh, for people when they reach that acute level uh, of uh, needing to go to emergency department of the women's and kids, needing to go to camps, that there's going to be help available for them. Uh, but too many people are discharged at the moment without appropriate follow-up, without care plans. And that, we know, is only going to lead to future admissions to the merry-go-round of the mental health system continuing. We uh, probably only have time for one or two more questions. And thank you to everyone who's been feeding them through. I'm sorry we're not going to be able to get to all of them. I'm hoping we've, uh, we've at least got somewhere near your question that you've asked. This one is interesting. I'm obviously don't have the capacity to fact check some of these questions, but I do know that this is, um, I, I've heard anecdotal evidence at least, that there are experienced clinicians who are leaving the public mental health system. There's obviously been some high profile ones who have um, who've talked about that because it's such a difficult work environment. What can we do to, to, to keep those people in the system and keep their expertise and their experience well, certainly, um, certainly, I've, I've um, spoken to mental, mental health leaders who have talked about the, the pressure on um, mental health staff. For example, in the area of psychiatry, um, I'm told that working in the, in the public sector is much more challenging than the private. One of the one of the calls that I make to, uh, to to mental health professionals is to make sure that they provide they they make their contribution to fair access to health services for all, all Australians. Uh, and I believe that, that uh, professions need to encourage uh, people within their professions to, to serve within the public health system. Uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of individual sites and situations, of course, as we Im improve services and reduce the pressure, um, that will make an individual work site um, more a more enjoy enjoyable environment uh, to deliver a service a service in. That's why we're committed uh, to innovation and investment uh, to improve uh, better services. It's certainly very important that we have um, strong leadership, uh, and that's why we've um, we've strengthened uh, lead uh, professional leadership uh, across uh, S SA Health. Um, we've interestingly seen a dramatic drop in the, the number of senior leaders leaving under this government compared with the previous government. Um, so there is um, an increasing stability at, uh, at, 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 at um, the leadership level, which I think is important to help provide the stability uh, moving forward. In terms of the, uh, the challenges by the, in relation to the mental health workforce, um, we've, uh, we've invested $5 million in last year's state budget uh, to provide services uh, to, su to support mental, mental health uh, mental health professionals will continue to work with uh, with uh, the, the leadership of our health networks, uh, the representative bodies um, to, to make uh, make a career in the South Australian uh, health service a a, a, challenge, a, um, a satisfying and enjoyable experience. Thanks, Tammy. Is this something you picked up in your parliamentary committee looking at COVID-19? Um, no, but it was something that uh, we looked at when I was on the Occupational Health and Safety Rehabilitation uh, Select Committee. And in fact, we know that uh, the Health SA, or SA Health uh, workforce has some of the highest rates of bullying and fatigue. And that was the focus of one of the inquiries that I was on. Uh, and that we know that there's, uh, you know, already identified uh, through various agencies um, that these are real cultural issues uh, in the public health sector in this state. Uh, those who work in this sector deserve the best work conditions and we have to address that through the leadership that we've seen from groups like the AMA but also others um, of actually not accepting that culture any longer. Uh, but beyond bullying and fatigue, also just ensuring that, you know, these are good um, stable uh, professional environments for them to work in, that they're not being required to go above and beyond, that they're not being drained and moving away from this very important area and that we're not losing 
good people, but we're also training enough coming through and not throwing them in, not, not trained well enough and not supported in the early parts of their career either. Chris, what would Labor do about this? Yeah. Well, it is an absolute issue that uh, urgently needs to be addressed. Uh, we do need to listen to our frontline uh, clinicians who work in the system uh, about the issues that they're facing because people are leaving, frankly, because they are completely burnt out. I mean, uh, we have seen uh, this happen. Uh, we saw a parliamentary committee just last year where one of our senior psychiatrists uh, left the system uh, because he was so concerned at the privatisation that was happening uh, of the Infant uh, Therapeutic Reunification Service of the Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, they're losing uh, their uh, confidence in the system because of what's happening. Uh, we've seen uh, the government over the past couple of years put out for voluntary redundancies for frontline clinicians to take up positions to leave the health services. Uh, and shockingly, the government's approved some people in mental health leaving those positions despite the massive shortage. So. We've had people uh, who work in child mental health, forensic mental health, uh, being approved for redundancy packages. We need every single person to working in the system. Uh, we need to make sure that we're listening to them. Uh, we have committed, uh, as uh, Tammy mentioned earlier, um, support for people in the non-government sector about making sure that there's portability of long service arrangements. In the public system, we've committed uh, to legislating for nurse-patient ratios to make sure that there is going to be enough support for patients when they need their care. But ultimately, we also need to listen to our clinicians. I mean, we had John Mendoza, the head of uh, the Central Adelaide RA and QEH Mental Health Services, uh, resign over a year ago uh, because he said that this was the worst uh, department he'd ever worked with in 40 years of state and Commonwealth around the country. Uh, there does need to be change, and we need to start by listening to not only our um, clinicians, but also the uh, consumers who use our services. Thanks, we were, uh, we were right on time. We've done so well so far. Let's not fall at the last hurdle. <laughs> we'll get a, go, I'm going to go to each of you for a, a quick hot minute summing up of your, uh, your vision. Well, the Marshall Liberal Government is going to continue, uh, if re-elected on March 19, uh, to strengthen our uh, mental health services through innov innovation and through investment. We've already put in $163 million in the last budget. We'll continue to roll out the mental health services plan with similar funding initiatives. In relation to people with lived experience, we are very keen to partner with, with clients to both make sure that their care is, uh, is focused on their priorities, their values, but also the, the services that they are part of, that are co-designed with them. And we've partnered with people with lived experience in the development of the urgent mental health care se service and also with the NGO uh, re redesign program. Uh, we would urge um, South Australians to, to not turn back, to continue to um, invest in uh, innovation, and better quality mental health services, so that we can uh, see a health system that is more holistic, that addresses people's mental health issues as well as their physical issues. Tell me. And I guess this is a vote uh, pitch, so a vote for the Greens in whether it's the federal or the state election coming up is actually a vote that is looking at the social determinants of health and mental health. It does turn politics and our society upside down and go back to basics and just say, what is it that we need for a future for all of us, for good lives, to build that extra social housing, to ensure that people aren't living in poverty, but also to take on the current structures, to put mental health and dental health into Medicare, to stop the cost shifting blame game and have a single funding agency, and also to ensure there is lived experience all the way through all of our policies. We won't be listening to uh, people who give us big donations because we don't take those dirty co corporate donations. So you won't see us trying to advocate that Chemist Warehouse should be selling rat tests and they shouldn't be free. And that's the same for mental health. We'll be ensuring that people get the care they need when they need it and that we're not um, a puppet of any uh, big uh, donors behind the scenes. Chris. Uh, thank you, David. And thank you for having us uh, here today. If elected, our absolute number one priority is addressing the health crisis that we're in, the ramping crisis, but equally the mental health crisis that South Australians are facing. It's only getting worse uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, we will cancel the $662 million basketball stadium. We will invest every single dollar into our health service, including mental health services, uh, inpatient community, 
but also uh, country, which we haven't talked about, the disparity of people in country. We've already announced uh, doubling the size of the mental health services in Mount Gambia. Uh, and we won't be embarking upon cuts to our services like we've seen in the past couple of weeks with the closure of intermediate care services in the western suburbs and the southern suburbs. And I just want to leave my last words uh, with uh, another woman who's contacted me uh, who uh, tried to get help uh, for suicidal thoughts at the QEH uh, some months ago was promised a bed in that Western Intermediate Care Centre, but it had to be rescinded because there weren't any beds available. Of course, now, today, that centre is closed, so it wouldn't be available at all. Uh, and she said to me, the staff of the QEH treated me with so much respect, but they are so overworked. I didn't get the full treatment I needed, but they tried their best. Our mental health system is so broken. I think that that sums up the views of so many South Australians, and that's why it'd be our number one priority to fix that. That brings us to the close of this section of the forum. Um, thank you, Stephen Wade. Thank you, Tammy Franks. Thank you, Chris Picton. For those of you watching, you might not know, but we're in a giant Alan Scott auditorium at the uh, at UniSA. It's quite an unusual environment. My voice is echoing. Um, so thanks everyone for being really engaged and um, and uh, and particularly you who are out there um, sending in these questions. They've been, they've been really good. I hope we've shed some light on some things. I'm sure that we've raised some questions for you all. To stay across the Mental Health Coalition of South Australia's election advocacy campaign, you can join their mailing list. It's on their website, mhcsa.org.au, or you can follow them on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. They're also gonna make a recording of this available on their YouTube channel. So now uh, we're gonna take a, a short break and come back in 20 minutes for some thoughts on this. There'll be a panel discussion, as I said before, with uh, Louise Pascal, um, who's a journalist, um, Ross Womersley, the CEO of SACOS, and Chris Chalubek, who's a lived experience worker. Thank you again. Who do you see? A daughter? A sister? Auntie? Mother? Grandmother, beachgoer, art lover with a mental illness. Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am and not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A father? A husband? Brother? Son? Board director? Chairperson? Footy fanatic? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by?
We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A husband? A father? Writer? Volunteer? Project manager? Basketballer? Coffee lover? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A daughter? A sister? Auntie? Mother? Grandmother? Beachgoer? Art lover? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by? 
We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am and not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A mother, a sister, the love of someone's life. Avid gardener, roly derbyist. With a mental illness, which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not for the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A father? A husband? Brother? Son? Board director? Chairperson? Footy fanatic? With a mental illness, which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with.
who do you see? A husband, a father, writer, volunteer, project manager, basketballer, coffee lover, with a mental illness. Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with. Who do you see? A daughter? A sister? Auntie? Mother? Grandmother? Beachgoer? Art lover? With a mental illness? Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am and not the condition I'm dealing with. Hi, I'm Louise Pascal, I'm journalist, journalist and media and communications consultant with the Mental Health Coalition of South Australia. Hi. Welcome to Afterthoughts, a panel discussion which reflects on the 2022 MHCSA Mental Health Forum that we've all just watched and I hope you've had a nice break in between. We are broad, broadcasting to you from Ghana land and would like to acknowledge Elders past, present and future. 
We recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and that knowledge of mental health and wellbeing has been held for he here for thousands of years by Aboriginal people. We would also like to acknowledge those with mental health challenges past and present and the value, impact and diversity of their lived experience. The Mental Health Coalition of South Australia draws from this understanding and wisdom as a foundation of their work every day. I'd now like to welcome our panellists today, Ross Walmsley, CEO from SACOS. Good afternoon, Ross. And Chris Chalabek, who is a manager in the lived experience workforce, who also features in one of our videos for our We Have to Get Our Heads Around Mental Health campaign, which you would have seen playing on our holding slides. Thanks to you both and welcome. My first question to both of you is, what are your overall thoughts on what you heard today? Uh, happy if I go, Ross, or yeah, we'll, we'll cheek, cheek it out, we'll um, um, play nice. So no, thanks, um, Louise. First, I just like to acknowledge too that I'm uh, broadcasting from Ghana land, so acknowledge the, the, the traditional owners and also acknowledge the importance of um, public experience. So I think um, what I'm drawn to initially is the, the vision, so sort of the visions that were being um, articulated. Um, and because I think uh, it's really important to look at that because um, visions, you know, they, they're, um, they're how we want things to be, you know, they, they, um, they're um, future orientated. Um, and in um, looking at the panellists, I'm, I'm sort of automatically drawn to our current state mental health services plan and, and the vision that sits within, within that, and that talks about high quality services, effective and, and safe services. But importantly, within I guess within that uh, vision is uh, a focus on human rights, so a service and service system that focuses on human rights. Um, but, and importantly, services and, and a system that supports people to live um, uh, well in the community, to thrive and fully, fully participate. So they're, the, they're kind of the things that I'm, I'm um, thinking of. And, and I think over, overall, to be honest, I didn't see, to see a really strong connection with um, what, was, what was articulated in visions with the, with the State Mental Health Services, Services Plan. Obviously some really strong positives in there, but again, I think there was a, a, a focus probably a little bit too much at the crisis end of, um, of health, of, of healthcare. So Chris, can I just pick up on that? So did you think that all three weren't really talking to the Mental Health Services Plan? Um, yeah, I think I think in parts. So I think yeah, in parts. But but I don't think um, each of the candidates had a had a really strong, clear vision that that, that kind of that that connected. I think it was positive. Uh, Minister Wade spoke of um, you know um, changes to legislation that would um, you know pr promote human rights. I think that was that was really really positive, and and then was articulated by uh, by you know, by the by the other panelists um, um, uh, later on. Um, yeah, but I think I think overall, um, um, and I think also too, uh, sort of a lack of um, focus throughout the discussion uh, around community-based supports, in particular psychosocial um, supports that uh, really do and, and have been shown to keep people out of out of hospital. Mm. And Ross, what were your thoughts? And Louise, thank you. And can I to acknowledge elders past and present? And, um, I am coming to you from Ghana land and uh, always was, always is, and always will be. Um, I was struck by, like Chris, that in fact, we didn't see a big vision emerge around what we were really trying to do with our supports to people who were experiencing mental health issues. And, and so in that context, we had the minister who, you know, as the government of the day spends time talking about the things that they've tried to do. We had the opposition shadow minister um, talking with some, some aspirations, able to describe some of the things that he felt he would like to be able to do. And um, then, of course, we had the Greens candidate in Tammy, um, rightly saying, while she isn't the government, the role that that she has continued to play has been one of accountability. And so she she has been trying to um, 
fix the bits and pieces, take the, the raw edges, if you like, off the actions that have been going on. The things that I was disappointed not to hear more about were the things that are featured in a couple of those little videos that you've you've been running, which is the stuff about how do we how do we move the conversation from the position of where people who experience mental health issues are taken for being the people they are and supported to deal with the mental health issues through the system in a way that that never detracts from the fact that they are people first. And indeed, the, the support that we provide to them um, enshrines their, their value, uh, recognises and acknowledges, and, and works to minimise the amount to which we ever take those people away from the community that they live in on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think, I think my disappointment remains that we didn't hear any of those people really talking in those broad, grand, big ideas kinds of ways about what they wanted to do and how they wanted to see the system shift and move. Mm -hmm. I think just picking up on, on Ross's, Ross's point, I think um, the, yeah, that, that grand vision, I think you know, the, there was an important kind of conversation around innovation and, and looking at innovative, innovative models. Um, which I think is important, but we've got to be careful and it'll be interesting to sort of see what comes out uh, later on down the track is that we don't focus too much on innovation and, and move away from services that are currently being delivered that, that we know that work and, again, keep people, you know, um, uh, well in the community and, and thriving and, and, and fully fully participating. So again, it was it was, it was an important point and, and, um, and interesting that that, that the notion of innovation was was put forward, but again, I didn't didn't hear enough of a um, uh, reference to to those important community based services like psychosocial services, and that, that are pointed out in the in Health Coalition's case for, for psychosocial services that work so well um, in in keeping people in community and thriving. So, Chris, that leads me to my next question for you, which is who do you think had the best grasp of what the sector actually needs? Well, I think probably what I was, in terms of what the sector needs, I think the things that kind of come, come to mind um, in reflecting on what's um, articulated in the State Mental Health Services Plan and, and other, other reports, the, the Mental Health Coalition, Coalition Report, is um, the issues around workforce. Um, you know, we know that there's a long-standing, um, it's an ageing workforce, um, there's workforce workforce shortages and we don't have the kind of the graduates coming through to fill um, the vacant um, the vacancies that, that are there. Um, obviously there's, there's cultural issues that, um, and, um, that, that the, the, the candidates spoke to, um, but also too compounding this complex issue is the, the projected increase in demand for mental health services. So whilst there was some reference to, to the workforce and, and the importance of, of making it attractive to retain staff, there really wasn't a, a clearly articulated vision, I think, for workforce development and, and workforce planning. So again, I think we need to um, be looking forward in the, in the coming weeks to sort of see what um, is going to be done in that area to address to address those needs. But we can have the best system in the world, but if we don't have the staff to, to deliver it, um, then you know we're we're in um, real trouble in, in that way. And also too, I think the the other thing I was looking out for, and this was really again clearly clearly articulated in the state mental health services plan, was the need to support the sector to to integrate, to collaborate, and partner to, to join up and provide integrated um, services. Um, and the benefits of that are that there's going to be, it's going to reduce the complexity of people navigating the mental health system um, and it's going to support wayfinding as well for, for people. And that really wasn't, wasn't touched, touched upon and there's, there's some great examples um, around, there, around um, the sector and, and in the north there's the, the Northern Mental Health Alliance where there's been a commitment um, uh, to, to fund and support and resource a forum for innovation, collaboration, um, and integration, but there needs to be a commitment for government, you know, um, to, to roll that to roll that out. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did did like though, in terms of, of what the what the 
the, how the sector can benefit was a, a really strong focus on co-design, and I think that kind of came across through through all the um, all the candidates. Mm. Louise, I know it's not I know it's not my question, but the other thing, I, the other reflection I had is that we need a workforce that is prepared in the roles that we need them to be prepared in. So at the moment, still our workforce tends to be focused on the tertiary end, the hospital end, the, that end of the system. We haven't got a really skilled, well-developed and well-resourced community-based set of networked, well-developed people in roles in those community settings that support people to stay in the community where they, where they belong. Yes, and that's one of the observations that uh, I made was there, in addressing that, uh, we want to address in one of the, the coalition's asks is around unmet demand. And to address unmet demand is around having that skilled workforce to do so. And that really wasn't covered in this. Uh, when the workforce was discussed, it was around that clinical um, model and the clinicians that are, that are leaving, but there wasn't really to address the sector's um, workforce. But Ross, while, while I've got you, what were your reflections on housing? Well, again, it was a bit like the, the workforce conversation. We really didn't hear, uh, we did hear um, Tammy mention the social determinants of health. And, and I think um, there might have been a reference from Chris at some point about uh, sort of some of the infecting issues that, that confound people. But housing is so fundamental to our well-being, and of course, if you don't have a stable home and you're not supported to maintain a stable home, then in fact, it's highly likely that your mental health is going to just get worse and worse. And we know that one of the one of the things that we've got in our community at the moment is that we've got a rental affordability housing crisis. We just don't have enough housing available, particularly for people on low incomes, um, that is energy efficient, that's stable, that's secure. And then on top of that, we don't have enough people available to support those people to thrive in their homes when they have major mental health issues. And so, you know, again, we didn't really hear that emphasis coming through. And, you know, at SACOS, at Shelter SA, like the Mental Health Coalition, we've heard repeatedly that, in fact, this issue is fundamental. And if we really want to do some early intervention around protecting the needs of our community as, as we recover from COVID, we ought to be investing in much more public housing so that in fact there is opportunities for people. Mm. Now, I was monitoring the questions and the comments that were coming through uh, during the forum. And a lot of people were asking questions that, that were around primary health care. And there wasn't too much around community-based support or psychosocial supports. Do you think, that uh, we're looking here at a lot of band-aids and, and not some real long-term integrated solutions? I think we could be at risk of risk of that. And it, I mean, it's, it's probably hard to make a call because, um, you know, in the absence of any real, real detail, but I think I think fundamentally with, without a, a significant investment in community-based psychosocial supports um, that address the unmet psychosocial support needs, um, you know, um, then we're looking at band-aids um, and we're, we're looking at a, at a system, a mental health system that's out of balance. Um, you know, I think over time, uh, since about 2014, 2015, uh, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's been about a 30% reduction in investment in community-based, you know, based supports, whilst um, and again, most recently, in the most recent budget, we've seen a significant investment in bed-based supports. Don't get me wrong, they're, they're, they're an integral part of the system, but, you know, they're only one, uh, only one part of the system. Um, and so I think, I think to avoid a Band-Aid solution, I think, I think it is um, looking to address the unmet psychosocial needs um, because we know um, that 
so 50 percent of people in the metro area, sixty something percent in in the uh, regional areas engaged with psychosocial supports won't um, will uh, avoid hospital, will avoid an admission. And there's also a really unfortunate statistic that I think about fifteen percent of people that are discharged from hospital will, will be readmitted within twenty eight days. And again, this is this sort of um, unnecessary and over reliance on the hospital system that can be avoided by an investment in um, psychosocial um, supports um, yeah, that, that really provide alternative um, pathways. And in, and in particular too, there will be times in, uh, where people need acute services, but the, with, with a good um, suite of psychosocial services, there's, there's important and appropriate discharge pathways for mm. people. And, and Ross, Louisa, what were your thoughts? Yeah. Of course, the thing, the thing that people ask about are the things that they know about. And because we don't have a really rich, well-developed set of network services to support people in community, people think that the primary healthcare setting is, is what people require or it's how the system responds. And so in that sense, I'm not surprised that that was the question that people were asking rather than a question about, well, where are the systems of psychosocial support that are ready for me at my community level? Um, until we build those networks and we help people understand the power and importance and the preventative capacity of them, um, we won't actually have people asking those for those kinds of services because they just don't know that they, they exist and that they're right and proper. Mm. Another thing, another really strong theme that was coming through, especially through the comments, was actually services to support children and young people, so youth. Uh, now, prevention is a scale and it can range from childhood, which helps uh, someone through their life through a range of services to prevent crisis. Uh, there are multiple versions of it. So who do you think is putting the best investment into a vision of prevention over a life cycle? I'll go if you like, Chris. Um, <laughs> I think that again, it's on my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> this was this was another area where we didn't hear a lot of conversation about prevention. And prevention prevention is something that can be done at all points in the system, at all times. You can always be doing something beforehand that might prevent something from happening. And we don't have, we don't bring that kind of attitude to the way that we design services. We, we actually bring a different one. And um, so again, I don't think we heard a lot of conversation about the importance of prevention um, and the role that prevention might play. Although to be fair, I think um, there were, you know, Chris certainly um, alluded to his interest in trying to build a preventative um series of of efforts um and i know that um to me and possibly the minister also would would agree that prevention is absolutely something we need to do what what i'm unsure that we have yet is any real vision of how that would be enacted and how we could be confident that in our mental health support system we were acting in ways, all the ways through the system to prevent people from ending up in our hospital system. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd agree with that, um, uh, Ross, sort of similar uh, observations. And it's interesting too, because again, coming back to the state mental health services plan, which I think is, you know, that, that should be our significant reference reference point, is that, you know, that, that clearly articulates the, you know, the need to increase access and engagement for, people um, experiencing perinatal mental health issues, infants, you know, children and, and young people. So there's obviously, there was a, some, some discussion and, and, and reference around um, supporting, you know, uh, children in, in schools, you know, that, that, um, that's important, but, it, but not a, no discussion, I, I believe, on, on perinatal mental, mental health. Um, and we know there's significant needs in, in that area and, and not um, even at that earlier stage of you know supporting infants, children, and families sort of prior to prior to the school age. So that, yeah, again, there really wasn't a clear, a clear, a clear vision. And again, we know and it's articulated within the statement health services plan 
the earlier you can intervene and the earlier you can provide support, so that's going to provide fundamentally and, and importantly, it's going to support people to live well, um, but it's going to um, uh, provide less burden on the health and the mental health system, you know, down, um, down, down the over the lifespan. As we come towards the end of our discussion, I just want to just a reflection from from both of you. It, you know, from what the questions that were coming in and from the feeling that is out in the community, there's a lot of crisis and there are people that are trying to deal with crisis. And that's what I feel there was a lot of a response to today in, in the answers. Who do you think has the best chance of actually stepping out of that crisis thinking and really delivering something that's going to not only work in prevention, but also deal with, with what we're experiencing now? Oh, I've put you both on the spot, haven't I? Oh, I mean, I think it's, I think it's heartening. Um, and again, I think we're, we're looking at a very small sample, sample size, um, you know, without any sort of detailed policy. But I think, you know, the, 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 um, the, the, the Chris Picton, you know, looking at um, diverting funding, you know, away from um, um, one initiative, you know, into health and, uh, and, and prevention. I think you know that that's a positive, uh, a positive sign. What that actually looks like will be, you know, will, will, will be interesting. Um, and I think um, you know, uh, Minister Wade, you know, I think there was a, a, a really strong focus around. Um, you know, uh, crisis-based supports and, and, and bed-based bed supports. I think positively, I think, you know, there, there was reference to, to the unmet, um, unmet needs report in the psychosocial um, services space. But again, what that will look like, what that will lead to um, is, it's honestly, it's a bit, bit hard to say, I think. I, I don't mean to sort of sit on the fence, but... No, that's fair. Ross? I think you have to give credit to um labor's announcement about how it's going to respond to the um, proposed stadium development and how it intends to not use the funds that might be absorbed there to do a whole lot of other other work um, now of course the the devil will be in the detail as to exactly how that gets spent and whether it's spent in a way that leads to the outcomes that we've been talking about um, but there is clearly an ambition, there's a recognition there that if you're prioritising something at the moment, it's probably not building that stadium, it's, build, it's actually building the, the social infrastructure that protects the interests of the state going forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, the Minister had, did have a strong kind of acknowledgement of the health crisis, but having said that, I didn't hear any planning about how we were going to deal with post-COVID. There, you know, there was a there was a kind of tentative acknowledgement that that was an issue, and that we had this burgeoning um, crisis. And clearly, you know, this was articulated by all three of them in some regards that there was there was an issue there. But again, we didn't hear um, a lot of proposals about how we were getting ahead of the game, um, how we were planning now to make sure. Now, you know, maybe that is what uh, putting mental health professionals into schools, um, that might be an enabler in that context. Um, but it would be very encouraging to hear, uh, particularly the major parties, because they're, they're the ones that will form the government and they're the ones that ultimately uh, it will be the government that will lead the agenda um, as we as we move to recover from the COVID crisis. And so it would be very encouraging to hear them speaking more articulately about the investments that they were going to make that would be protective and preventative um, of uh, all, you know, many of the issues that are going to emerge for people around their mental health. Yes, Ross, I think uh, Tammy used the uh, phrase that uh, COVID was the earthquake and that mental health will be the tsunami, which uh, is something to reflect on. Thank you both. That's all we have time for. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to everyone out there for joining us and, and uh, for our reflections. Uh, to stay across the Mental Health Coalition of South Australia's state election advocacy campaign, you can jump on our website 
website and you go directly to the page nhcsa.org.au slash fund dash mental dash health. That goes through all of our campaign and it also takes you through our advocacy and destigmatizing campaign. We have to get our heads around mental health. Thank you so much for your time today, Chris and Ross, and to all of you out there. Thank you and stay safe. Thank you. Enjoy your afternoon. Who do you see? A husband, a father, writer, volunteer, project manager, basketballer, coffee lover with a mental illness. Which one will you define me by? We have to get our heads around mental health. We just have to. See me for the person I am, not the condition I'm dealing with.